in response to the Gilded Age, we talked about the growth of a reform movement, whether it be the existence of the labor unions or the populist party. But also in terms of the latter, we talked about how by 1896, the populist party had been subsumed under the mantle of the Democratic Party when William Jennings Bryan ran on a fusion ticket between the populist party and the Democratic Party. And therefore, some of the most radical ideas found in the populist party platform lost the race. They were no longer considered realistic and therefore they were pushed aside. Well, problems continued to fester in the United States, therefore a new movement would spring forth. And this would be a different movement than the ones that we talked about earlier. It would not be workers on the railroads or in factories and in industry. It would not be farmers who were leading this new revolt against the lingering effects of the Gilded Age, but rather it would be middle class reformers who were speaking out not only about the economic problems facing this nation, but also some of the moral issues that they believed were plaguing this country. And these middle-class reformers were known as progressives. And that is what we are gonna be talking about this class, in this class, uh, the progressive movement. And we're gonna be beginning this story by looking at an effort to expose the underbelly of the United States, whether that be the, the working conditions of people, whether it be the plight of immigrant workers. And then we're gonna talk about some efforts to rein in some of the excesses of the robber barons by turning to the effort to tr bust the trusts. And I'll talk about how these big corporations are causing some problems in the United States and how these progressives attempt to change that. Finally, we will get to the issue of democracy. We talked about at the beginning of the semester, democracy being a major theme that is gonna run, be a prevalent issue across the board, across history, the 20th century, late 19th and into the 20th centuries. And what we're gonna talk about in terms of democracy is that one group who is still denied the right to vote, and that is women. So we're gonna finish this class by talking about first wave feminism. I wanna spend just a minute by talking about what these progressives wanted and who they were. So here are the progressives and their goals. Progressives believe that the growth of cities and the emergence of big corporations could not be curtailed. Therefore, they are very pragmatic in the sense that they are not of the belief that perhaps like the populace, that control could be returned to the people and therefore taken away from these major corporations and the robber barons, and people could live in peace in the countryside. Rather, what these progressives believed was, is that a change had to occur, and things had to be made more humane. Institutions had to be made more responsive to the republic and to the public, and morality had to be brought back to this nation and changes could occur to do these things, but it could not be wholesale. Rather, acting primarily from a middle-class perspective, these progressives wanted to avoid class divisions. So therefore, they did not describe the producers, as we saw in a lot of the uh, labor union documents and the populist party documents, where they talked about the producing classes deserving more of the wealth they were angry that a lot of this wealth was not given to the people who made these products, whether it was the railroads or whether it was the farm produce, but it went to the robber barons. We don't see that producerist language in the progressive language. Rather, they turned to scientific expertise and impartial commissions to solve the economic and social problems of the day. One of the biggest problems that these progressives faced and reformers before and after would face was the fact that most Americans simply did not pay attention to the problems that were plaguing the nation. So therefore, something was needed to shine a light on Gilded Age America.
And what stepped into the breach here was a new type of journalism that began in the early 20th century. And this new form of journalism was known as muckraking. Interestingly enough, muckraking was a term coined by Theodore Roosevelt, who was a critic of these journalists because they caused him a lot of problems when he was president. And he described them as muckrakers because in, according to this terminology, they were mucking up or they were, they were raking up a lot of the muck that was on the ground, the dirt and the grime, and they were making it visible. And that was a problem because again, that made him look bad when he was president and it made other leaders look bad as well. But nonetheless, this muck raking was very important to again, exposing the problems of American society. So as a result, you'd have 10 cent magazines like McClure's who published investigations by writers including Ida Tarbell, who wrote an expose on Standard Oil, remember Rockefeller's business that we talked about in an earlier class, but also on Lincoln Steffens. Lincoln Steffens um, wrote a report on graft in the St. Louis political machine. Also in an earlier lecture, we, in an earlier lecture, we talked about the, Tam, the, the Tammany Hall machine in New York City. We talked about the plight, the problems with that. Here we see in one of these 10 cent magazines, Lincoln Steffens reporting on a similar dynamic in St. Louis. The muckrakers also published entire books to expose wrongdoing or other health and safety issues. One of the most famous is one that you'll read an excerpt for in this week's readings, Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, which he wrote or published in 1906. And this dealt with the meatpacking industry. So what we're seeing here is an effort to again, bring attention to the terrible conditions facing so many Americans during the Gilded Age. But there was another way that people brought plight to these people, the plight of these people to the public's attention. And that was by providing services. And one of the most important services provided was the idea of a settlement house. And the most prominent of these settlement houses was the Hull House down in Chicago. So I wanna provide here a little bit of history of this Hull House, the image of which you can see on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. And just as a side note, you can actually still go see Hull House down in Chicago. It's near the University of Chicago at Illinois, or the University of Illinois at Chicago campus down in Chicago and it's a museum now, and you can see this structure and how it was so important for this immigrant community that lived in this area, this meatpacking district of Chicago. But nonetheless, in September of 1889, September of 1889, Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr came upon a dilapidated mansion, which at that time was known as Hull Mansion. And this was located on Polk and Halstead streets in the center of the 19th Ward. Now this is important to understand because this 19th Ward was home to many of the new immigrants from Greece, Italy, Russia, and Germany. So with this in mind, a lot of these immigrant workers were working in the meatpacking plants that were talked about in Upton Sinclair's Hull House, or excuse me, in Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Now with Hull House, Jane Addams and Ellen Starr attempted to educate the wealthy upper class by exposing them to the rough conditions of these overcrowded immigrant neighborhoods. Once knowledgeable about the subject, these wealthy upper class Americans would, at least according to Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr, they would seek a more just society achieved through greater government regulation. Well, as for the immigrants, Hull House was not just a charity, but rather it was a means to self-help. Immigrants at the Hull House would be taught how to adjust and improve their lives in America. Therefore, Hull House operated a kindergarten, a nursery, held classes for adults, and also organized social and cultural events for the community. In short, we see two goals with Jane Addams Hull House. First of all, bringing the races together. And I want you to be careful when you're looking at the document from Jane Adams when she talks about the races. 
does she mean skin color here? Does she mean ethnicity? Or does she mean something else? Because what we're seeing here, at least what I'm talking about in this lecture, is Jane Addams wanted Hull House, again to repeat myself, to shed a light on the terrible conditions faced by these immigrant communities in Chicago and therefore hoped that they would urge these wealthy citizens of Chicago and nationally would urge the government to step in and provide greater services and regulation of the workplaces for these immigrants. But nonetheless, whether it's through muckraking or whether it's through Hull House, an effort is being made here to say to Americans, we have a problem. Yes, everything is nice and shiny on the outside. You have these lavish mansions and these fancy parties in certain, avenue, in certain neighborhoods and cities across America, but there are a lot of people struggling, and that's what these two institutions aimed to show. A lot of these problems that were being exposed by people like Upton Sinclair and Jane Addams were as a result of the major growth of corporations in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So therefore, a lot of progressives felt that if you really want to improve things, you need to break apart these corporations, these so-called trusts. So let's talk a little bit about this, what trusts were and how they were trying to be broken apart. Between 1897 and 1904, there were about 4,000 companies. And these 4,000 companies were consolidated into 257 corporations. Thus, by 1904, 318 trusts, 318 trusts were worth about $7 billion, $7 billion. So as you can see here, it's not just an issue of these trusts coming together and these companies coming together, but it's the fact that these, co by coming together, these companies are accumulating a vast sum of money. And this was all happening despite an earlier effort to restrict such actions. For instance, in 1890, the US Congress passed something known as the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act was meant to basically, as the name implies, prevent companies from coming together and forming these trusts that would become too unyieldy and therefore be unable to be regulated. But here's the problem. It did not consider all monopolies illegal. Only those that, in its words, unreasonably, unreasonably slowed free trade. But it wasn't just the fact that the Sherman Antitrust Act didn't do enough. There was also the issue that unfriendly courts tended to use this piece of legislation to actually limit the growing labor union movement, claiming that these unions were getting too big for their own best interests. So therefore, instead of weakening the actual trust, the corporations, these courts would use the Sherman Antitrust Act to weaken the labor unions that were fighting for the workers. Trust busting, therefore, did not occur until a strong executive in the White House could lead the charge. Who was that strong executive that was needed? It would be the man that we see on the left hand of the screen, Theodore Roosevelt. We see here this image, this idea between good trust and bad trust. And you're gonna see that a lot more in your documents this week um, trying to distinguish between good trust and bad trust. But nonetheless, Theodore Roosevelt would be known as the trust buster. He would take on corporate America. And I want to begin here by going to just months after entering the White House. We would see Theodore Roosevelt ordering the U.S. Attorney General to break up the Northern Securities Company. The Northern Securities Company was a transportation monopoly ran by J.P. Morgan. Now here's the important thing, and this gets into this idea of good trust and bad trust that you'll see in the document that I mentioned just a couple seconds ago. Roosevelt did not want to destroy all big business, but rather he simply sought government regulation. So therefore, his big thing was that you need to take the bad trusts and you need to regulate them via the government. Well, during his eight years in the White House, 
Roosevelt would use the Sherman Antitrust Act about, eh, I'd say probably a good 40 times or more. So what we will see is that this 40 times or more, taking this action against 40 trusts, was more than three times, or excuse me, was more than his three predecessors combined. But in addition to this, in addition to government regulation, and trying to break up the trust, we would see him pass other acts and sign other new legislation to law that helped weaken corporations and helped empower the worker and the consumer. Speaking of the consumer, an example of this is the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 and the Meat Inspection Act of the, as well. Both of these to, were aimed to prevent the manufacture sale and transport of any food or drug deemed unsafe for consumption due to mislabeling or contamination. The 1906 Hepburn Act, the 1906 Hepburn Act meanwhile, gave the Interstate Commerce Commission the authority to investigate and set railroad rates. This is extremely important here because what this did was it ensured that you would no longer have the sweetheart deal signed where you had these railroads sending, giving rebates to the robber barons, as we talked about in a prior class, because now all these railroad rates would be set by the Interstate Commerce Committee as stipulated, stipulated by the Hepburn Act of 1906. So here's the key thing. As these regulation, as this regulation grew and the regulating powers grew, the number of federal employees would more than double from 1900 to 1916. So as a result of this, what we see is this reliance on scientific expertise, this reliance on regulation that is tied to the progressive era also brings another aspect of progressivism to the surface. And that, that is the fact that progressivism is viewing government in a different way. It is in support of a bigger government. Remember previously, we were talking about laissez-faire government as allowing for the, the existence of Gilded Age America. Well, now during this progressive era, that is no longer the case. This is not a do nothing and see nothing government. This is a government that is gonna be more regulatory. It's gonna be more interventionist. And as a result, it is gonna get bigger. So what I want you to use this period in history as a precursor to the New Deal. We're going to be talking about the New Deal as a dramatic change in the role of government because government will become a lot larger, not only in just sheer size, but also in its responsibilities. And I want you to use this class as sort of a midway point to that end, where here we're changing from laissez-faire government to a more assertive and interventionist government with this idea of dealing with trusts, dealing with food safety, and dealing with interstate commerce on the railroads. In addition to the growth of the federal government, we also see a growth on the political scene, and that is the rise of a new third party. And again, we talked about another third party, the Populist Party of 1892. This is sort of the Populist Party Part 2, Populist Party Version 2. Because as you read this document for this class and for this lecture on the Progressive Party platform, which we see on the left hand, a picture of it on the left hand of this screen, you're going to see this Progressive Party platform talk a lot about giving power back to the people. And that's why I argue that it is sort of Populist Party Part 2 or Populist Party Version 2. So let's talk a little bit of background about the Progressive Party and this 1912 election. And we're going to begin the story again with Theodore Roosevelt, because since his days as governor of New York State, Theodore Roosevelt had angered more conservative Republicans than ever with his progressive bent. When he left the White House in 1909, Roosevelt became a leading critic of his Republican successor, a guy by the name of William Howard Taft. Well, two years later, in 1912, he campaigned for the Republican Party nomination. Here's the issue, though, of 1912. In that year, only 13 states allowed their citizens to select presidential candidates in primaries, 
Now during the election years, that is all you hear. You have these different primaries and the people are given the option to choose their candidate. 1912, only 13 states. Just as importantly, of those 13 states, Roosevelt won nine primaries, Taft only two. Um, interestingly enough, the, the only victor besides these two was in Wisconsin. Robert La Follette would win the nomination in Wisconsin. He was a progressive candidate. But nonetheless, despite this massive wave of support across these nine states for Roosevelt, the Republican Party still nominated the standard bearer, William Howard Taft, the guy who was president then, running for re-election. Roosevelt was no doubt angered by this, so therefore he decided that he was going to bolt the party. And as he did so, he decided that he was going to become the candidate for a new progressive party. And this progressive party held its nominating convention in Chicago in 1912. Here's the thing. Roosevelt, during his speech, and as candidate for the progressive party, would put forth his vision for what he called a new nationalism. And this new nationalism called for a much stronger government. And in addition to calling for a much stronger government, it offered support for women's suffrage, corporate regulation in the public interest, and labor laws. So as this was going on, we now have a three-person election in 1912. You have William Howard Taft running for the Republicans. You have Theodore Roosevelt running for the Progressive Party and a former president of Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson, running as the Democratic Party candidate. Now, of these parties, if we were going to classify them, put them on a scale of conservative to most radical, Theodore Roosevelt is probably the most radical progressive of these three. He is followed in the more moderate approach by Woodrow Wilson, and then the most conservative is William Howard Taft. Well, in the end, the Democratic candidate, Woodrow Wilson, took advantage of the Republican Party split, and he would win. But here's the thing. Woodrow Wilson would win just under 6.3 million votes, 41.8% of the popular vote, compared to Roosevelt's 4.1 million votes, or 27.4%. William Howard Taft came in third place, and interestingly enough, fourth place would be filled by Eugene Debs, the socialist that we talked about earlier in this class. So what we're seeing here is Woodrow Wilson is chosen as president, but not with a clear majority. He only won 41.8% of the vote. So therefore, what we're going to see during his presidency is he will have to move leftward. He will have to become more progressive himself in order to get the support of more Americans. And we'll see that in a later class. But nonetheless, here in 1912, Woodrow Wilson successfully wins election to the White House. I wanna to return now to unfinished business. If you remember when we were talking about the Reconstruction Era, we talked about the Reconstruction Amendments. And if you remember, the 15th Amendment was the right to vote. Now. When we looked at the 15th Amendment in this class, I mentioned that the fact that it said all males were now allowed to vote. Therefore, this meant that the women who had fought so hard over the previous decades to free the slaves as part of the abolitionist movement, they were denied any sort of rewards for their activity by, continually, by continuing to be viewed as second class citizens, not eligible for the right to vote in America's elections. So therefore, out of this anger forms a women's movement that had always been around, but it really grows and materializes in the late 19th century. And we're gonna start here in 1890 to tell this story that will lead up to this so-called first wave feminism. And actually, maybe before I tell the story, I should mention this. Why is it called first wave feminism? Later in this class, we're going to be talking about women in the 1950s and 1960s and into the 1970s for that matter who are fighting for a certain set of rights and this will be known as second wave feminism so therefore this movement 
for suffrage, the right to vote, is known as the first wave feminism. The right to vote, first wave feminism, rights beyond voting, second wave feminism in the mid 20th century. So I wanted to get that out of the way before we move ahead. But now let's get back to the story here in 1890. Because in that year, the National American Women's Suffrage Association followed two different approaches, this major women's rights organization. On the one hand, you had Carrie Chapman Catt. Catt lobbied politicians and sought to win the right for women to vote at the state level. Alice Paul, on the other hand, demanded, demanded immediate action by the president and Congress. This latter group, led by Alice Paul, eventually formed the Congressional Union in 1913. What this Congressional Union did was it organized national demonstrations, sent delegations to the president, and lobbied congressmen to pass the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Well, eventually, in 1916, the Congressional Union formed a new political party. This new political party was known as the Woman's Party. Now, before 1916, before the 1916 presidential election, the Women's Party sent 11, orga sent 11 organizers to 11 western states, plus Illinois, to encourage women to not vote for Wilson and Democrats until they for supported the 19th Amendment. I'll look at the map here in a second after we look at this slide, but this was an effort to basically use women's electoral power in the vote, where they in the in the ballot box in the West, where they could vote, and therefore pressure the Democrats, pressure Woodrow Wilson to do what the women wanted. Well, as all this is going on, a woman by the name of Inez Milholland. Inez Milholland was one of the women sent west. Interestingly, mainstream suffragists condemned the Women's Party strategy, claiming that it would hurt women's causes. Well, Milholland, however, would argue otherwise, and you'll see that in the document that you're reading for this week. But nonetheless, here we see an effort um, by these women to use their electoral power. You can see the image on the right, women of Colorado, you have the vote, get it for women of the nation by voting against Woodrow Wilson, Democratic candidate for Congress. Um, their party opposes national woman suffrage. So again, this was the approach favored by the National Women's Party. Inez Milholland was a key voice in this and she would become probably the most prominent due to her unexpected demise, because what would happen to Mill Holland was that she was exhausted from giving so many speeches that she collapsed while on stage in Los Angeles and would eventually die a month later of anemia. Thus, in January 1917, more than 1,000 suffragists picketed in front of the White House and they would demand a change. And we'll get to that in a second. But before we do that, I want to turn to a map to show you why the National Women's Party was actually correct in their strategy. As we can see by this map of women's right to vote in various states and when they achieved the right to vote based on different levels of it. And as we can see, the National Women's Party understood westward in states like Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, or excuse me, not Nevada yet, in, or Nevada in 1914, yes, California, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, the whole western part of the nation allowed women to vote. Why not use that voting block to put the fire to the flame of Woodrow Wilson Democrats and say vote for our cause? And you can see how pivotal that was. Those are important states in the election and the Democrats would need the support in these nations. But interestingly enough, another point that I wanna make is to show why this was the case or explain why this was the case that all these Western states did allow women to vote. It was, very, it was very simply the reason they wanted to attract people. So therefore, one way that these Western states attracted people was by giving women the right to vote, giving them the political power that would entice women from the Eastern seaboard where there was mostly no suffrage to the West where there was suffrage. I wanna to return to that January 1917 picket that takes place in front of the White House where more than 1,000 suffragists 
marched back and forth in front of Woodrow Wilson's Washington home. And what they did was they would walk around with Inez's words emblazoned on their banner. And what was what Inez Milholland said? You can see it on the screen. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? They would do this again and again over the next 18 months. Many of these women would actually be charged with obstructing traffic. Alice Paul, the leader of this National Women's Party, was sentenced to seven months in jail where she would lead a hunger strike and would have to be force fed in order to survive. Wilson would finally, after this constant pressure from these women, Wilson would finally announce his support for suffrage in 1918. The following year, June 1919, the 19th Amendment was ratified and it would be approved by the necessary 36 states in 1920. So here we have nearly 50 years after all men were given the right to vote in America, all women are given the right to vote with the 19th Amendment, which was approved in 1920 after being ratified the year prior. So here we have expansion of the democratic wish in America. Women finally achieve the right to vote. But as I mentioned earlier in talking about the first and second wave, women by the mid 20th century will say, it's not enough to give us the right to vote. We need something more. We need other rights. And that of course we'll discuss later in this semester when we talk about second wave women's feminism.